You're listening to a podcast from the Abbey Theatre's Oral History Project. For more information about the archive, visit abbeytheatre.ie. Hugh Hunt worked at the Abbey Theatre from 1935 to 1938 as a play director, and again in the 1970s as artistic director. In this podcast, we hear director Patrick Mason and actors Des Cave and Kathleen Barrington recall his work. And, and, and Hugh had been brought over as a response to Hilton Edwards, uh, because Hilton and Michael's work, Hilton, you know, had, was real director, um, doing all this work, and the Abbey was being faulted all the time on, on the, 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 the standards of their productions. And so the board had responded, Yates had responded, by going to uh, Sir Barry Jackson, who was then at Birmingham Rep, and asking Barry Jackson to recommend this, all this thing, you know, to recommend uh, a young director who would be prepared to come and work in the Abbey to raise production standards. So the board, which was Yates and Frank O'Connor and the rest, uh, they, they still were the executive board, they programmed, but Hugh was the director, uh, the producer of plays, the play producer director. And he then brought in Tanya Masevich as a designer, and the two of them fairly revolution did actually respond to the gate challenge, to the, to the Hilton Edwards challenge. You know, Hugh's narrative was very much that this, there had been a resurgence in the late 30s. Uh, there had been a return to, if you like, the those early artistic standards, you know, WB bringing in Gordon Craig and bringing in, you know, they had been shaken up by the opening of the Gate Theatre. They been were, were, were reacting to that by going back to look at European work as well as, you know, keeping up the, the, the new Irish playwriting, but they saw themselves as an art theatre responding to this. And the whole thing is, you know, of course, cut short by the death of Yeats and then by the outbreak of the war. And Hugh, of course, went back to, to, to England. And within a 12 months, Blythe was chairman and managing director. And the whole thing kind of closed down, uh, you know, and became a folk theatre and became, you know, the, the Pico was, was to become the centre of the Irish language theatre. And, and we were deep into Sodom and Begara. You know, um, uh, and so so coming to the sixties and then the new building and then bringing Hugh back. I think there was, as I say, this this attempt to get back to these roots that the Abbey wasn't just um, Begara. You know, it wasn't just a folk theatre. It was actually an art theatre and a national theatre and indeed a people's theatre. You know, those those are, are at least three identities. Uh, I mean, I always thought one problem that the Abbey's problems is there are too many identities, but they're, they're interesting identities, and the folk identity is one of the, the least interesting, one of the lesser ones. Um, but I mean, the weight of that company was was these these tremendous character actors. I mean, wonderful, wonderful old character actors. But it was a very damaged company as well. I mean, they had been, you know, they had borne the brunt of the, the Blythe years. And there's no question that you can argue about Blythe, you know, that he, there wouldn't have been the new theatre without him and all of that sort of stuff, which is, there's truth to that. But he was creatively, artistically uh, a disaster, a disaster, you know. And the memories of the old Abbey, the pre Blythe Abbey, had really sort of been obliterated. And that was also why Hugh was back, that Hugh Hunt. See, when, when, when the whole Blythe thing came to an impasse in, in the mid-60s, uh, it was the company turned, Ray, Ray McAnally and others, Vincent and others, turned to Hugh. But they, they turned to Hugh as a sort of, I suppose, link, you know, that he had this direct link back to WB8. Mm. Uh, and that he'd known Yates and Frank O'Connor, and he'd known that Abbey pre-1939, before the Blythe sort of takeover. And I think somewhere, consciously or unconsciously, there was this attempt to kind of link back into some way. And of course it was Hugh who kind of remodeled the theatre, the, the governance of the theatre in terms of the artistic director and the general manager, which was then, post-war, was the norm, 
in all European theatres, British yeah. theatres, you know, to split the, the thing. Uh, and to move to a non-executive board, <laughs> that didn't go down so well, yes. uh, to a non-executive board with to appoint an executive and then sort of stand out of the way. Um, so Hughes, and, and working with Hugh, looking back on it, I mean, it was tremendous in that, that first season to work with him and what a, what a wonderful man he was. And a gentleman, an absolute gentleman, you know, extremely organised. I remember, you know, the first day of the, the Silver Tassi rehearsals and he opened his prompt book and every move was written into his prompt book. The whole thing. He told me he had a set of teddy bears that he worked through and he said, now if you're going to direct, this is what you must do. You must, you know, the actors rely on you to know precisely where they have to be when they do whatever they have to do. And you must make sure they're in the best place possible to do whatever they have to do. And I was tremendously impressed by <laughs> this, this level of organisation. And, and that was the huge thing in theatre, you see, then. I mean, now it's all conceptually driven and everyone's talking about X, Y, Z. And I'm not recommending it, but, you know, the big thing there was, as a director, because, I mean, even the role of the director was still questionable, um, well, at least you've got to be organised. And I'm the actor, now you tell me where to go. A bit passive-aggressive, really, but, you know, uh, there was this thing about, and that's what made you, in a sense, a good director, that you came in and you knew exactly where everything went, and you weren't phased by anything, and you organised everything, and everything went smoothly. And the actors learned their lines, and they did their thing, and that was what made a good director from the actor's point of view, and uh, from the theatre's point of view. There's quite a lot to be said for it, actually, but anyway. Um, so, uh, so I was tremendously impressed by this. Uh, though I remember at the end of the first day, he said to me, where's your notebook? And I said, what? He said, your notebook? I notice you haven't got one. And I said, well, I, you know, I, he said, go out and buy a notebook said, and keep notes. So the next day, I was like a secretary shot and I was taking notes of everything. Professor Hunt. Or human. But the thing we were bowled over was that he came in, showed us the sets, had little figures, little soldiers, to show you where you move, and all, he had it all mapped out, every scene. And then we put it on the floor. And this was, my God, you know. But he said, well, that's, I mean, we were fascinated, but he said, no, that's, that's most directors in England do that anyway. Well, you didn't have to say, where do I move here? Because he said, well, I've already told you where you're going to go there. But when I've got there, could I do this or could I do that? And he'd say, yeah, we'd play around with it. Mm -hmm. I think initially a good director has to have a vision and empathy for the play that he's actually directing. I think one of the difficulties that Rhea, for instance, would have had was that she had a number of plays that she wouldn't have had a particular empathy for. So she did a good production. But what makes a great director, I think, is somebody who intimately understands the nature of the work. And this is really kind of counter, to, I suppose, to what Yeats and Lady G believed. I mean, they believed that the word was the thing and the director was just necessary to get things going. And you needed actors, naturally, to say the beautiful words. But a good director can actually inspire you and allow you to discover things that you never actually knew you could do. But he also has to have the whole shape of the thing. He has to have an overall view. Actually, I mean, you are telling a story. So you have to make sure that you have your audience on board all the time. So it isn't just indulgence in saying, I'm going to love this wonderful work and allow things to happen. You have to know when the mood has to change. Hugh would come to rehearsal having a complete picture of everything that was going to happen. He had a wonderful designer in Alan Barlow. Alan and himself, they had a great empathy. And Alan would have designed a set that would allow it. They would have talked about it in detail, in the whole planning of it and the design of it. So he knew precisely what was going to happen. I liked working with him enormously. I, I suppose, in a way, you're intimidated, first of all. Like, he was English, had a reputation. So you're always nervous if it's somebody new. But 
He wasn't at all. He was very sympathetic, very understanding. Thank you for listening to this podcast from the Abbey Theatre's Oral History Project. For more information about the archive, visit abbeytheatre.ie.